leadership. It's the hardest skill for a CEO to acquire and the one that's most important. And now, faced with an unprecedented crisis, we are seeing leadership defined in real time. The actions CEOs are taking now will shape our economy for years to come, and their decisions will determine which companies move forward and which are left behind. This is Leadership Live with David Rubenstein. Hello, this is Leadership Live. I'm David Rubenstein coming to you from my home in Bethesda, Maryland, a home, as I've said before, I've spent more time in, in the last 30 days than I have in the last 30 years. And today we're particularly fortunate to have somebody who's been in the middle of a food crisis in the view of some people, uh, and that is Dave McLennan. Dave is the CEO of, of Cargill. He's been the CEO about seven years now, been in the company for almost 29 years, a little bit more than 29 years. And he's a person who knows the food world extremely well. Now, Cargill is a company that is privately owned. It's the largest privately owned company in the United States. Is that right? I think that's correct uh, by sales, yes. And so uh, your principal business is what? It's food production, food distribution, food trading? Yeah, it's all of that. So it's food production. I mean, things, everything from beef to poultry to chocolate, but also uh, food ingredients, things that go into prepared foods or that occur in other foods as also a, uh, feed for, a food for livestock as well. We do have a trading business, both financial and agricultural products. And how many employees does uh, Cargill have now around the world? We have 160,000 employees in over 70 countries. If you count the countries where we sell but don't have a physical presence, it's probably closer to 125 countries. This week, uh, John Tyson, who's the head of Tyson Foods, a competitor of yours, I assume, in certain areas, mm -hmm. said that the food chain was maybe breaking down in this country. We're going to have to close facilities. Um, do you agree with that? And are you worried that the food chain is breaking down? I think I would characterize it that the, the food supply chain is under strain, but there's a lot of supply chains that are under strain due to what's happening. And certainly there have been food production facilities in various parts of the country that have had to close because of illness or because of supply destruction. But I think basically the ability of us to produce food uh, is still there. There are going to be momentary closings, momentary is in the right word, but we had a facility, a beef facility that was closed for 17 days, but it's now back up and running and has been for the last week. So I think the food, food industry and the food supply chain is resilient. I think the people that work in it every day are resilient. So I, I think it's under strain, but I, I don't think it's, it's broken. Well, in response to Mr. Tyson, I think uh, the president issued an executive order today saying that under the Defense Production Act, he is going to, in effect, uh, command that uh, food production companies uh, stay in business and make their workers go to work. Are you aware of that executive order? And do you think that's necessary to make sure that you can produce all the food you want in your, fa in your facilities? I am aware of it. I saw it on the headline right before we, we sat down together. So I don't know the details, but it's going to call the question of keeping the American public fed to keep food on the shelves, but also balancing that with the uh, the health needs and the concerns and also the emotional health of, of the workers in the plants. So we're going to have to find the, the balance between the two. Of course, if you have illnesses at a plant such that you can't run, you, you don't have a choice. Or if you have certain vital facil uh, uh, functions in the plant that, that are ill and can't come to work, uh, then you can't run the plant either. But so far, I think by and large, we've been able to the industry has been able to run. We've had tremendous support from the USDA in terms of having the inspectors on site. You can't run a plant without USDA inspectors. So I think it remains to be seen of how we're gonna manage that dynamic between the health and emotional safety and physical safety of the workers in the plants and the executive order of which I'm, we're still studying the details. Well, let's, let's talk about, for people that don't really understand exactly how meat is produced, uh, meat is produced in large facilities where people are working very closely together. So is the problem because they're so close together, you have to make certain that they're not going to get this virus. And how are you now doing that? And how might you do that under the new president's executive order? 
Well, I mean, we have taken a lot of different steps in the last two months since the virus began to expand. So everybody at our facilities uh, is temperature checked before they come in. If they show any signs of any symptoms of COVID, they are asked to leave and quarantine for 14 days, not leave the facility, but leave the parking lot. Uh, everybody has a face mask. Uh, we have no visitors are allowed in the plant. Uh, we have appropriate physical spacing in, in the lunchrooms. Uh, we put up uh, plastic dividers if people can't have appropriate physical spacing. To your point, there's a lot of people in these facilities, a lot of, of brave and courageous people that come to work every day and that take their obligation to putting food on the shelves very seriously. There was a sign at one of our plants uh, that someone had written that said, thank you to all the employees of this facility. You are feeding 22 million people a day. So the amount of production that's coming out of one beef facility is pretty substantial, uh, but many steps have been taken to ensure the safety and, and health of the employees. So explain to people who are watching why, for example, uh, people now have to, um, let's say, not produce as much food in certain areas because restaurants aren't open or, or places like McDonald's don't have as much traffic as they used to. How has this changed the food uh, distribution and manufacturing business? Well, I mean, there's been a significant shift, as you would imagine, from food service to retail. And with restaurants, quick serve and white tablecloth and fast casual, all the different categories have been significantly impacted by stay at home orders. I, I would say this, that the orders for food service in the first three weeks, let's say, let's go back to March 1st, showed significant declines. There has been uh, subtle increases in the last three weeks, because I think number one is uh, restaurants are getting used to, whether it's curbside pickup or home delivery, takeout, whatever forms it may take. I think number two, consumers are getting used to it and becoming more comfortable with the idea of, I can't go to my favorite restaurant, I'll do whether it's Uber Eats or one of the um, DoorDash or one of the services that can deliver to me, or sometimes the restaurants are delivering themselves. I think I just read that uh, the average person in the United States eats roughly five meals uh, a week outside of their home historically, and now it's maybe just one or two, so people are eating more at home. And I guess if you're eating more at home, you're cooking more at home, and is it a different type of packaging that you need for producing food for people that are gonna eat at home as opposed to selling it to restaurants or places like McDonald's? It is because you're selling more individual packaging when you're cooking at home or smaller packaging, as opposed to a McDonald's or a quick serve restaurant, or, or you know they may buy you know like bulk packages of eggs that they can use, or or maybe they're um, uh, prepared eggs, and and so for sure the volumes that you see at the retail level are smaller or portion sizes, I should say. The good news, and and as I mentioned, we had the beef facility that was closed and it's reopened is we had closed a couple of our egg facilities since we are an egg supplier to various restaurants, quick serve restaurants around the country. And we have ramped up capacity in the last couple of weeks as we've seen examples of demand coming back. Now, obviously at some point, these animals are going to be uh, uh, killed, uh, the cattle or the chickens <laughs> or the pigs, but now uh, reports are that they're being killed earlier than normal because there's not enough demand for their um, or their meat, for example. Pigs, uh, there's not as much demand for pork, I guess, as before. So pigs or piglets are now being killed earlier than they would have otherwise been. Is that true? It's starting to show up. It's certainly starting to, to occur. And it's, it's, let, it, it's, it's two pieces, David, which is, um, one is demand. So as I mentioned at food service, where people can't go out to eat or you know, the, the uh, demand for curbside or delivery or pickup, is not the same as, is lower than it is for in restaurants. So indeed, uh, demand has come down on the food service side. There was a story in the, in the local paper in Minnesota, uh, which described a uh, chicken farmer that, you know, raised the chickens to produce the eggs that had to euthanize over 25,000 chickens simply because it becomes more expensive. The eggs are not being converted or sold in the food service. Um, and and uh, but on the side on, on, on the level of or the component of pork and beef, uh, I think more of that is about plants being closed. So yes, it's it's technically demand, but it's not necessarily demand at the consumer level. It's the fact that many plants have had to close that process beef and pork, and so then there's a backup in the supply chain. Panic buying was uh, prevalent, uh, let's say a few weeks ago. It seems to have leveled off, but is there going to be enough food for everybody? So should I go out and? panic, buy some things tonight, or 
Is there going to be enough food in the food stores for me to get food anytime I want? You know, it's going to depend on where you are and it's going to depend on your proximity to where the food is produced and also to the, the demographics and the buying profile of, of the local stores. But I would maintain that there is enough food in the system. You may see temporary supply disruptions. For example, you talked about pork and pork production for reasons that I talked about and beef production is down about 25 to 30% from typical levels. But there's enough food in the system. The food supply chain is, is resilient. Chinese are supposed to buy a lot of uh, food products from the United States. Do you think in light of their economy slowing down, they'll be able to do that? I do believe that they will be able to fulfill their commitments under the trade agreement that was cut. In the food world, uh, you are at the top. I presume you're doing reasonably well financially. You haven't disclosed them uh, this quarter, but can you say you're doing okay or it's really impacting you financially? I'd say we're, we're doing okay. I mean, as, as you said, we're, we're private, so we don't, we, we have released our earnings. So, you know, in the fourth quarter, certainly a pickup in retail uh, has, has been helpful, but there's also been demand destruction as, I, as I've right. talked about in food service. But, you know, I'd say we're doing okay. If you look at the stocks, the stocks that have been hard hit in the food area are the food uh, restaurants and chains like that. Uh, but the ones that are doing well, the ones that had problems before, packaged goods and packaged food products, uh, are that a surprise to you that many of them are now doing much better than before, like Kraft Heinz and so forth? It, it's not. I mean, it's the, you see the shift from eating away, and you, as you mentioned, an average of five meals a week. And, and maybe maybe it's down to one or zero if, just because they can't get to their favorite restaurants. Uh, but our, our family is cooking at home. We're, we're cooking at, at home more than we ever have. And the fact is, companies, as, as you mentioned, Kraft Heinz or ConAgra or Campbell's, um, people are buying packaged foods and they're buying shelf-stable foods. Um, so they're buying things that are going to last for a while. And in some cases, there have been examples of, of panic buying and hoarding where people don't know how long this is going to last and if supplies of their pay favorite foods are going to be available in a couple of weeks or a couple of months time. So I think there's some accelerated demand. Are farmers suffering uh, enormous financial losses or are they being subsidized in effect by the U.S. government? Are farmers going to go out of business or are there going to be bankruptcies among farmers or not? Well, it's, it, I'm very concerned about the farm community. So they've had the, the support and certain components of the ag sector have had government support. But the fact is, is, as you were alluding to, work your way back on the supply chain. So if you have plants to go down because of illness or because of demand destruction, which means the livestock starts to back up and maybe some of the animals have to be euthanized. I think in the case of beef, uh, you know, you can change their diets, you can slow down the processing or slow down the growth. And, and so it, it, there probably is less instant of euthanization of that particular species. But then they all are also eating um, products. Their feed is grown by the farmers. And the majority of products that are grown in the U.S. of, of row crops go into feeding the livestock. So I am concerned about farmers. Prices have been low for a long time. Uh, there is, you know, the good news is there's, there's plenty of supply in the system. There's plenty in storage. Uh, but it means that the prices are low and that, you know, I think bankruptcies last year in certain segments of the ag sector were at record highs. So it's something that we're keeping a very careful and thoughtful eye on. And they're a community that needs to be supported. So if I wanted to invest in something in the food chain now, given where we are, should I invest in uh, farming communities? Should I invest in producers of food? Should I invest in wholesalers? Should I invest in traders? Should I invest in retail, mm. uh, restaurants? Uh, what would you recommend? I think, um, you know, I think that I think the switch from food service to retail, there's going to be some permanent level of shift. And you can see different statistics and different prognostications about how many restaurants are going to reopen. And certainly there'll be some that they were small or they were niche that, that won't be able to reopen. And therefore, I think retailers will pick up that demand. I also think um, I would call them healthy ingredients or organic foods. Um, things like probiotics, prebiotics um, are, are going to increase in, in uh, popularity. 
under the trade agreement that uh, the Trump administration negotiated with the Chinese, the Chinese are supposed to buy a lot of uh, food products from the United States. Do you think in light of their economy slowing down, they'll be able to do that? And do you see any evidence that they are doing it now? I, I don't think, uh, certainly their economy has slowed down, but as I mentioned, we're up and running in China. All of our plants are running. And so they're, they're in the, call it the recovery stage. But I think the fact of the matter is 1.4 billion people have to eat. And the Chinese depend on the outside world on trade uh, in order to feed their livestock or to supply their to supply their animal protein, for example, and other products to their population. So I, I do believe that they will be able to fulfill their commitments under the trade agreement that was cut despite an economic slowdown. And we're better placed to turn than the United States to get those products. And but it's not it's planting season in, in North America. So ultimately, when harvest season comes in late summer, early fall, that's when you might expect to see bulk purchases of commodities going to China. Now, you're in the distribution business. When you distribute food around the world that you manufacture, you produce, are you doing it through trains, planes, uh, trucks, uh, boats? Uh, and are those systems all working as well as they did before? Yeah, I mean, it's all of the above. It's mostly rail, truck, barge, and ocean-borne transportation. So one of the fun facts about Cargill is at any point in time, there's about 550 ships on the ocean with a Cargill source product on, on at any point in time. But those systems, and if you think about the American food system, and, and as you were tracing the supply chain back to the farmer, uh, to the livestock producers, to the, the plant operators, to the retailers, it's also the transportation system. And so the courage of the truck drivers, and the people and, the, and the, train, the train operators, I mean, we depend on all of that. And it's something that people, I think, take for granted. They don't realize how much goes into manufacturing and distributing food. But to your point, right. we're seeing the capacity. And when I had spoken to the White House in the past, I said, can you make sure we get the inspectors from the plants done? The USDA, Secretary Purdue has done a great job of that. Can you help us make sure we have access to transportation and logistics? to get the food to where it's needed. And yes, it is performing very well. So how is your relationship with uh, the administration, the White House, do they consult you? Do you talk to them with, uh, for, for um, regularly or how does that work? We, uh, I have found the administration, but also members of Congress to be very good listeners. And I have had some inbound calls where members of Congress have called us and said, how can we help? What do you need? How can we help keep the food supply system running? I've been on two calls with the, with the White House and the administration, again, asking for what do you need? And one was very early on in the process. So it was like second week of March. And one was more recently with other industries, not just food, but also construction and energy um, and some other industries as well. But I have found them to be very solicitous of what we need, what kind of support that we, we need to have to keep the, you know testing, to keep employees safe and to help make sure that the plant workers who are on the front line every day are well protected, both physically and emotionally. What lesson have you taken away from this experience? Are you gonna manage your company differently in the future? The world's gonna change, right? Economically and, and socially, everything is gonna change. Uh, and so we will change along with it. Let me ask you how you're managing this business, your company now. You're mostly working out of your home, but sometimes you go to your office. Um, is it hard to manage uh, this way? Because most of your employees are probably at home, I assume. So what have you learned about how to manage your company? It's a gigantic company. How hard is it to manage in this uh, manner? I think we've all adapted pretty well to communicating, whether it's on Zoom or Skype or by phone. I think everyone has been struck, and I don't think this is unique to Cargill, uh, but it, that it can be done. I miss the face-to-face -face interaction. Uh, I saw a couple of people in, in the office today and it was almost startling to see some other faces other than the ones that you know, you're sequestered with. Um, and I think you know, part of our culture has been the, the social relationships that develop over a, in a company over, we're 155 years old. So I miss that aspect of it, but you know, the building that I'm in today has capacity for 2,500 people. 
I, I don't think we'll ever see that many people in the building again. I think some people are going to decide, you know what? I like working at home. I can be effective. I can, you know, get my work done. Uh, the ones who want to stay at home in the future may not be ones with small kids and dogs, but that's sure. another matter. So yeah. let me ask you, um, if you have uh, the ability to bring all your employees back, I guess you will do so. But I'm told that some CEOs say, and now I, I don't need as many employees as I thought I did before, and maybe I won't bring them all back. Is that something you think is a prevalent view in the CEO community that you can downsize in the future? I don't think it's a prevalent view today. And, you know, Minneapolis, St. Paul is unique, and we've got roughly 20 Fortune 500 sized public and private companies headquartered in this in the Twin Cities community. So there's a lot of conversation about, you know, resuming work and, and uh, physical distancing and when to do it. But I have not heard anybody in, in this community or really any of the CEOs that I've been talking to talking about, we've got to, uh, you know, get rid of people. And actually, I, I really hope that what has happened uh, changes the, the ethos of this country into um, realizing that the impact that this has had on, on the most vulnerable, on the people that are, are suffering the most, that has made it worse. And that there's more a sense of, you know, the, the phrase that was being uh, used prominently, as you know, in the last year or two is responsible capitalism. I hope that we don't have to lay anybody off other than I've mentioned we've had to close some plants because of demand, but that's our objective. But I don't think anybody's thinking that way at this point in time. One of the phenomena that I've been watching as well, which is often hard to believe, is the enormous amount of cars that are lined up for food in the United yeah. States at food banks or their equivalent. Um, are you surprised that there's so much demand for food from people who really, I guess now, probably can't afford to buy it in the normal prices? I'm not surprised. I mean, I think one of the things this, the crisis is highlighting is that the people that are most vulnerable are the people that are the hardest hit. And I think the fact is, um, you know, food for many people is, is uh, unaffordable or, or very expensive. And so I think uh, so one of the things we're doing and many companies are doing is supporting food shelves and food pantries, not only with, with money, but also with in-kind donations and donations of meals. Uh, but the fact is, it, food is harder to get access to with the closure of some restaurants. And so the lines that we're seeing, is it, it doesn't surprise me, to be honest with you. What lesson have you taken away from this experience? Are you going to manage your company differently in the future? Are you going to uh, uh, change a lot of things that you've done? Or basically you say, I got a pretty good system now and I don't need to change very much. Boy, I think, you know, if we don't change and if the world, the world's going to change, right, economically and, and socially, everything is going to change. Uh, and so we will change along with it. But I think the role of technology in our business and everybody's business has become more clear and more pronounced than ever. I think the resilience of the food system, the food supply chain uh, has really impressed me of the people that are in the plants, the people that get the food to where it's needed. Um, I think the way food is consumed, the way it's delivered, and the way people think about it is going to change dramatically. And so we're going to get in front of that. I mentioned healthy food ingredients, delivery systems that meet the new world where people are going to stay more isolated, more socially and physically distanced. Uh, we're going to we're going to have to change, and we will change. And we are already beginning our planning for that for you know for the future. Right. So I always like to worry about something going wrong. I always. Uh, you know, look at the glass as being a half empty, I guess. So if I wanted to worry about something in the food world that you live in, what should I worry about? I would uh, only say that, as I said, there may be some spot shortages of certain kinds of protein. You might not be able to get um, you know, the exact cut of, of beef, pork, or chicken that you want to have, but ultimately the production is continuing and the plants are coming back online to keep the, you know, the food system safe and to keep it operating. Uh, but overall, I, I sleep very well at night and I think you should too, David. 